Our lectionary reading last week was all about how it was that Moses came to be placed in the Nile River when he was three months old, and how Pharaoh's daughter, countermanding her father's order to drown all Hebrew baby boys, rescued him and placed him back into the arms of Yochebed, Moses' mother, and Miriam, his sister, until such time as he was weaned and ready to enter life at Pharaoh's court. Our reading today opens with Moses at age 40, so I thought it might be useful to do a little backfilling to give you an idea of what Moses might have been up to in the course of those 40 years. A good place to begin that story might be with Jochebed, his mother, as we see her here with Moses tucked under her arm in this rather remarkable imaginary portrait by Pedro Américo. Américo was Brazilian, but was trained as an artist at the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, under the finest artists in France at that time. He lived in Florence for much of his life, but constantly traveled between countries in Europe and his base in Rio de Janeiro. He was certainly exposed to the mania for all things Egyptian that had been raging throughout the 1800s, and thus this portrait of Jochebed by the banks of the Nile as she prepares to set her son afloat in the great river. I was intrigued by her outfit and particularly its decoration. Why did Americo depict her with so many cowrie shells? And here is what I found, and I quote, in ancient Egypt, women were highly valued for their ability to conceive children. In order to protect their fertility in the future, girls and young women wore cowrie girdles. They would also be worn during pregnancy in order to protect their child from any harm or complications and have a safe and successful delivery. It was also believed that women and children in ancient Egypt were often the targets of the so-called evil eye, an evil spirit that would haunt them and was to blame for miscarriages and deaths. The only way to stay protected from the malicious effects of the superstition was by wearing cowrie shells every day for the rest of their lives. Cowrie shells were also very valuable. They were used as jewelry and as home decor. The more cowrie shells one had, the wealthier one was thought to be, and the more respect one was accorded by the people. Because of their high value, cowrie shells were commonly used as currency, and they traded the shells for things like food, clothing, and other necessities. So this is Americo's way of paying tribute to Yochebed, covering her with cowrie shells, which, according to ancient Egyptian superstition, have assured the safe birth of Moses and his continued protection from the evil eye. But what is really interesting about Moses' mother is her name. The first syllable stands for Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, the tetragrammaton, the proper name for the Lord God. Yahweh is the very first person in the Bible whose name incorporates the proper name of God. And in Hebrew, it means Yahweh is glory, or Yahweh is my glory. We know that she was of the tribe of Levi and married a man who was also a Levite, which is the priestly tribe amongst the 12 tribes of Israel. As such, it doesn't seem too fanciful to think that she knew the history of her people. Moses spent perhaps the first four years of his life with his mother, and it seems likely that she passed on to him the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and explained how it was that the Israelites had come to dwell in Egypt rather than in the promised land of Canaan. So, when Moses was introduced into the court of Pharaoh, he undoubtedly had an understanding of where he came from and who his people were. With that in mind, we're ready to consider the early years of Moses' life. We're going to begin with a large fresco by Sandro Botticelli. 
which conveniently encapsulates five episodes in the early life of Moses in one work of art. As we consider it, we will be brought right up to the time of our lectionary reading for this Sunday, which is about Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. First, a few words about where this fresco is located. It was part of a very grandiose scheme by Pope Sixtus IV to renovate the entire Sistine Chapel in Rome. It is called Sistine after him. It's easier to say Sistine than it is to say Sixteen, so the X gets changed into an S. The project was begun in 1473, and the work of interior decoration and the creation of frescoes began in 1481. You are looking at the interior of the chapel with a view towards the altar and the image of the Last Judgment on the far wall by Michelangelo. Our fresco forms part of an entire series about the life of Moses, and it is on the south wall of the chapel, as you see here outlined in red. On the opposite wall are narrated scenes from the life of Jesus, and the two walls are meant to complement one another, with each event in the life of Moses having its parallel on the north wall in the life of Jesus. This is how our fresco looks in its magnificent setting, with the Latin inscription above reading The Temptation of Moses, the editor, you might say, of the written law. We read the fresco from right to left as it illustrates five scenes from Moses' early life. The first episode is in the lower right corner, and it shows us Moses in the act of killing an Egyptian, whom he had seen abusing a fellow Israelite. Moses, identifying with his own people, was incensed at what he perceived as injustice and took the law into his own hands. He thinks that no one has witnessed his action. If we look above and slightly to the left, we see Moses about to assault a fellow Hebrew because he had seen him abusing a member of his own people. When he is about to strike the man, his intended victim basically says, who do you think you are? Are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? Moses realizes that his earlier murder of an Egyptian had been witnessed, and word of it had spread. In fact, word had reached Pharaoh's ears who is so outraged that he is determined to have Moses killed. And so we see Moses at the top of this portion of the fresco, hot-footing it out of Egypt. Moses is easily identifiable in his gold and green outfit. The second episode, narrated by Botticelli, is in the middle of the fresco. It shows Moses, who has escaped to the land of Midian, standing at a well with two lovely young ladies, dressed in very elegant 15th century Florentine garb. They are, in fact, the daughters of a local priest named Jethro, and they had come to water the family's herd of sheep and goats at this well, but a group of shepherds tried to prevent them from doing so. Moses gallantly steps in, fends off the shepherds, and waters the animals himself. As a reward, he is given one of Jethro's daughters in marriage. The third and fourth episodes in the fresco bring us to our reading for today, which is as follows. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, 
from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord went on, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorite, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. How long had it been since Moses had heard the name Yahweh? I am who I am. Probably since the time he heard it from Yachabed's lips when he was about four years old, and now he is age 40. But he had never forgotten who his people were or the name of the God they worshipped. How utterly astonishing it must have been to encounter this God he had always known about here in the middle of what the King James Version of the Bible wonderfully refers to as the backside of the desert, speaking to him from out of a burning bush. After committing murder and attempted assault, Moses had had to flee for his life. And in this distant land, far removed, from both the comforts of Pharaoh's court and the company of his own people, he had plenty of time to think about what he had done. Yet God, Yahweh, had sought him out in the wilderness, perhaps Moses' own personal wilderness, and was commissioning him to go back to Egypt and lead his entire people, all the Hebrew slaves, out of Egypt and into the freedom of the promised land. Our abbreviated reading does not allow us to see all the ways that Moses tries to get out of doing this. It begins with, who am I to do this? Then it becomes, who are you? What is your name? So I can tell the people who the God is that is calling us to leave Egypt. Then it's, what if they don't believe me? What do I do then? And when he has been given several miraculous signs to show the people that the Lord God is indeed with him, Moses tries again to beg off, saying, I'm so sorry, God, but I'm not a good speaker. I never have been. I'm tongue-tied and awkward. At which point God has had enough and angrily upbraids Moses. 
Who do you think gave human beings their mouths? Who do you think makes them deaf or mute, blind or sighted? I do. And I will teach you what to say. But Moses continues to resist and finally, lamely, says to God, Pardon me, Lord. Please send someone else. And now God is even more angry and frustrated with the man he has chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But he does make one concession. Moses' brother Aaron, who is actually on his way to meet Moses, will be allowed to speak for him. The Lord also assures a very timid Moses that the Pharaoh and all the other people who wanted him dead are gone. And that brings us to the last scene, number five of Botticelli's fresco, in the lower left corner. This is Moses leading his extended family, and an exotic group they are, out of Midian and back to Egypt, where he will tell all the Israelites that the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh himself, has seen their plight and that he has called Moses to lead them out of Egypt to freedom in the promised land. Presumably, the woman in blue is Moses' wife, Jethro's daughter, Zipporah, and the two little boys she is attending to are her two sons with Moses, that is, Gershom and Eliezer. Gershom, the elder, holds the little white dog. And so Botticelli neatly sums up five critical events in Moses' early life in a single fresco. Moses gradually develops the courage and strength needed to lead his people as he slowly learns the lesson we all struggle with, that is, to trust God to do what he says he is going to do. Next week, we will see a more fully-fledged leader, one who has been tested repeatedly as Moses prepares his people for their first Passover and a journey they will never forget. Hope to see you then. And in the meantime, be safe, be well, and be blessed. <laughs>